I sat there and watched a guy and a girl offload like nine kilos of fentanyl from a floor compartment. And they were about 150 yards away from this uniform police officer that was sitting at a, at a taco stand buying some lunch. And they weren't in a garage. They weren't in, they were just sitting in the parking lot. Uh, the female was sitting there watching the, the cop while he's ordering his tacos. And the guy was unloading the compartment. It was, it's nuts. It's like, this stuff is like right under your nose. And unless you are constantly watching for it and picking out the right people, you're going to miss it. Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference April 23rd through the 28th, 2023 at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. It's going to be a great experience. Five career-changing days. Some of the most profound speakers in the industry. Guest speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Congressional Medal of Honor winner, Fox News host Tommy Laren, Navy SEAL American war hero Jason Redman, Sheriff David Clark, Sheriff Mark Lamb, and Sheriff Wayne Ivey. You'll also spend time with all of our Street Cop instructors at this event Monday through Friday. We'll have a great lineup of courses in addition to our great speakers. It will be a week that you will not forget. You'll be thankful you came. You don't want to miss out. Check out streetcop.com on how to register. If you're going to use the room code, make sure you book it from Sunday through Friday. That's what the code's good for, and it's about half the price of the regular rate. But those rooms are running out, so make sure you sign up now. We'll see you there. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino. I have with me today one of our newest instructors, Jeremy Bedingfield. Uh, I don't know what I can talk about his agency, but he certainly is a fucking savage on the road and has a lot of uh, real significant seizures under his belt. And he'll let you tell you how he came to us. Um, but Jeremy's committed and his course coming out, The Anatomy of a Criminal Motor Vehicle, is going to be badass profound and he'll share some shit we're actually sharing a lot of stuff already in our social media platforms and he's got a lot of really important knowledge so without further ado thanks for being here today jeremy beddingfield yeah i appreciate you having me on i'm excited to be here and talk about the class and hopefully get it going soon what uh we have your first class scheduled right yeah i think i think there's two that are that are scheduled badass check out streetcop.com to find them shits but yeah, so uh, the anatomy of a criminal vehicle, it's going to be essentially a class about searching cars. Like that's going to be the main focus is how to uh, identify a criminal vehicle as part of it. And then most of the focus is going to be how to search a car, how to clear all of the voids in the car, how to know where to look. Uh, I'm going to go over you know things that are normal and that you should be paying attention to. And that way, when you see something that is abnormal, it's going to, it's going to, you know, raise your eyebrow and you're going to want to dig a little bit deeper. So it's going to be a very intensive class in terms of uh, going from the most basic types of hides to advanced concealment methods that are used by the cartels throughout the United States. Tell us about you. Where did you grow up? Where do you work? I don't know if you want to say your agency's name. If you just want to play it safe and redact that, but you could just keep it with vague answers and your law enforcement experience and that shit. Yeah. So I was born and raised in a small town in Oregon. I joined the military straight out of high school, which brought me down to San Diego. Uh, after I left the military, I got hired on the department that I'm on currently in 2010. Uh, I worked a variety of assignments. I worked the jails courts, patrol. Uh, while I was on patrol, I worked uh, as a field training officer, which really got me interested in sharing knowledge and, and teaching people how to be better cops. Uh, from there, I went to a proactive law enforcement team where it was a uniform position. And basically the whole purpose of the team was to go to a certain jurisdiction and try to lower the crime stats through proactive law enforcement. Uh, you know, even though we live in California and, and people probably think that it's not exactly a law enforcement friendly state, there's it, it, in San Diego, it, it, it's pretty proactive. Most of the agencies around here are, are, are good to go and and they go out and they try to fight crime. Uh, from that team, 
I got selected for the team that I'm on now, which is a proactive law enforcement team as well, but more investigative. So we have, I think, 15 people on the team and we go out and we focus on border related crimes and the border being the border of Mexico. So anything with a nexus to to the border, we focus on those types of crimes. And obviously, you know, everybody knows that a lot of dope comes from Mexico. So we end up focusing on on cross border or international smuggling cases a lot. And we do a lot of uh, investigative cases. We have a variety of of investigative means. I don't want to go into everything, but, you know, we have undercovers, we do informant work, we do long-term cases, short-term cases, all the typical stuff that you would do in a, in high level, uh, drug smuggling cases. Uh, in in the San Diego area, how far are you from the border? Like close to to, Tijuana is over there, right? Yeah. Like my office, I can throw a rock and hit the wall, like the border. Wow. Is Tijuana (laughs) safe to visit? Do people still go there a lot and visit it? Yeah, I mean, it, you got to stay away from the bad areas like anywhere else. And for the most part, from my understanding, I mean, I, you know, I, I know plenty of people that go down to Mexico and and have a good time. But I think the problems come in when you're involved in criminal activity and you go down there, and that's when you're going to run into issues or you know a rival cartel or rival rival drug trafficking organization is going to have a problem with you being in their area. But for the most part, you know, if you want to go down and have some tacos or something. It it's probably relatively safe. I was asking Vic Galarza, who does our cartel stuff, uh, what he thought about him going to Mexico or me going to Mexico. And he actually thought it'd be a really bad idea. Certainly him, uh, but he also suggested that I may want to stay out of Mexico because of the inherent corruption. He's like, you don't know if you're on that list, and what'll happen is if you go over the border they'll notify the cartels. And if you're somebody they don't, they have interest in, they'll come looking for you. They'll try to find you. Yeah. I mean, I could see that happening. I, I don't know of anything that has specifically occurred like that in terms of, you know, U S law enforcement going down there and having problems in that manner, but it's always a possibility. I mean, it's a possibility anywhere. The cartel doesn't just exist in Mexico. They're up here too. So uh, I think that for the most part, they probably want to, run below the radar you know they don't want to be causing problems with us because it's just going to ramp everything up for them well that was my tijuana question you answered it so (laughs) you know i i I think that we should probably start with maybe if you're okay with it emphasizing what kind of seizures you guys have had even in the past year with some of the stuff you share with me although just verbally and some, you know very very vague because you haven't really shared a lot of intimate details of your investigations. But uh, maybe you could talk about some of the things that you have been able to knock down in in some regard. Yeah, so the primary focus of our team is interdicting these, these loads of dope. And so we use a variety of methods to identify people that are smuggling and vehicles that are smuggling. And so... We identify somebody that's smuggling, depending on the circumstances of the case or or what the case agent wants to do with it. We may uh, turn it into, you know, a short term investigation where we start identifying other people involved and uh, identifying stash houses and take action on them. Or it may turn into a more long term investigation where, uh, you know, the same type of thing, but obviously you're trying to identify more of the the players. And those are the investigations that end up taking us across the country. Uh, We've had many cases, even this year, that involve people that are smuggling dope from, you know, here to the East Coast or smuggling money from the East Coast back here. Uh, We just had a pretty significant seizure not that long ago that was an East Coast-based vehicle bringing a, a large amount of money back this way. I work a canine, I handle a canine, and my primary responsibilities are interdiction. I, I'm uniform most of the time. I, I do do plain clothes stuff every once in a while if, if surveillance is need, needed, but my main focus is doing stops on vehicles and finding compartments. That's kind of like my specialty is, is if 
you know, if you have a car that's been stopped at the border and they haven't found the compartment, uh, typically I'll be the one that will go stop it and, and try to search it. So it's, it's helped me learn a lot this year. We've, you know, we hit loads a lot. I, I don't, I don't like want to, I, I want to try to be humble here, but like we, you know, we we're pretty active. Uh, we hit a lot of loads. It's usually, you know, one or two a week of, you know, you know, 20, 30 kilos or, or, or whatever. There's some big ones mixed in there. There's been, you know, 2000 pounds of meth. There's been a 5,000 pounds of meth. Sometimes an investigation will, will lead us to a tunnel and that's where the real big seizures come in. You know, when you're hitting thousands of kilos of, of cocaine or, you know, millions of dollars, but yeah, that, I mean, that's basically what we do. I, I I don't know how much in terms of details that I can go into, but there's been many, many seizures this year. Most of them are vehicles that are trapped out that have compartments in them and we're just traffic stopping them and seizing the dope and arresting the people that are smuggling. What other things have you found while employing these kind of tactics and work? I mean, I believe you've mentioned in the past that you guys have found firearms and anything else that's, that's, you haven't mentioned, you talked about money and narcotics already, but what else have you found? We've had firearm smuggling cases. Uh, I had a case where they were taken. I, I don't remember how many it was 15 or so unserialized pistols down to Mexico. We had another case my my team had this case. I wasn't there for it, but uh, they seized, I, I don't even remember how many rifles it was, but a lot of assault rifles that was in the back of a car that was destined for Mexico. Uh, we've seized, you know, pallets of 50 cal rounds and, and other things that were destined for Mexico. Um, obviously large amounts of money. And then we, we run into a lot of, of, I guess, street level type stuff every once in a while. If you're doing interdiction on the highways, Every once in a while, you're going to get behavior from somebody and it, it's going to be something that would be lower level, somebody that has a warrant or, or you know, street level dope dealer or something like that. Um, but we try to stick to the higher level smugglers if we can just to, you know, there's so much dope that's out there. If you wanted to go take down a street dealer, you can pretty much do that any time of the day. But we try to focus on the higher level smuggling. What motivated you to design a class like this? How do how do we come across each other? I've been following you for years, and I really like the street cop method of teaching people how to be proactive. Like that is my bread and butter. When I was on patrol, I tried to be proactive as much as I could. Like that, it, you know, as long as the beat was clean, there's no pending calls or whatever. Then I'm out and I'm hunting. You know, I'm I'm not one of the guys that goes and sits at the station. So I've always been into that. So it, your company has really resonated with me, and I and I just really like it. So as I grew through my law enforcement career, I got shoulder tapped, I guess you could say, to start teaching interdiction at a uh, California post school. So there's a there's a school here in California and they have an interdiction segment. It's like four hours, uh, very brief. And so I've been teaching that for a few years, just getting my feet wet. And I mean, as you know, when you first start teaching, it's really weird and you, and you got to get used to it. It's something you got to learn. So I was using that to, to learn. And then once I got to the point where I was like, okay, you know, I think I'm ready for something bigger that's when I decided to reach out to you and, and see if you guys were interested in taking on a course. And part of my complaints with the course that I was doing, it was a four hour course that you would talk about interdiction. You would talk about uh, target selection. You would talk about roadside interviews and hidden compartments in four hours. It's just not enough time to cover all that stuff. Uh, I want to be able to go in depth and talk at a level that I feel is, is needed. I don't want to just breeze over things. You know, if I'm going to teach you how to find a certain compartment, like if I'm going to teach you how to find an intake manifold compartment, I want to go in depth on it. I don't want to just breeze over it real quick and then provide nothing that's really going to be useful in the field. So my idea was to create this class that is a single day class and it's just all hidden compartments. Uh, Obviously, there's more that goes into 
a criminal vehicle than just hidden compartments. You There's things that you can use to identify them while they're on the roadway, uh, different record checks that you can do. Cartels, they obtain vehicles in a certain manner for the most part, and they employ a fleet of vehicles, if you would. And there's things that you can do while you're on the roadway or during an investigation that can help you identify those vehicles and it can help you select better targets. So for example, if if I'm driving down the roadway or if I'm posted on the shoulder doing interdiction and I have a car that goes by me and it piques my interest for whatever reason, maybe it's uh, there's some type of behavior change and I decide to jump out on the car and, and check it out. If you are doing an all crimes approach uh, it type interdiction, you're probably just going to pull the vehicle over on face value and just see what you have. I try to focus a little bit more on, on the higher level smuggling. And so what I'll do is I'll jump out on the car and then I'll start doing record checks. I'll look at a variety of different things that will help me identify whether or not that vehicle is one that I want to stop. So my whole goal before I even stop a car is to be very suspicious that that vehicle is being used to smuggle. And then same goes into, uh, you know, roadside interviews is you need to have very intensive training on roadside interviews uh, that teaches you the right questions to ask. It teaches you how to recognize deceptive behaviors. It teaches you how to talk to somebody in a manner that when you're done talking to them, you're either pretty sure that the car is loaded or you're pretty sure that the car is not loaded. Because I've wasted a lot of time searching a car that wasn't loaded and I probably have no business searching that car. So I guess what I'm getting at is I wanted to go in depth on hidden compartments and that's one class that I wanna do. In the future, I would like to go in depth on interdiction and roadside interviews, but I feel like those deserve just as much attention as hidden compartments. And there's just no way that you can fit a very in-depth class on both of those topics into one day. So for right now, what we'll do is we'll segment it or, or separate it out. It'll be hidden compartments. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we do in particular in terms of identifying load vehicles and then also how you can investigate load vehicles. So I guess an example of that would be, let's say you're doing interdiction, you do a traffic stop and you find an empty compartment and you let the car go. Around the country, it's it's kind of hit or miss on whether or not people follow up on those cars. Some interdiction guys will just let them go and they're like, oh, well, it wasn't loaded today. Uh, some interdiction people follow up on them. And there is very good tools that you can use that you can follow up on them. And, you know, the, the first few years that I was on my team, most of what I did was investigations. I, I worked informants. And so I have a pretty good idea of how to conduct a, an investigation into a higher level smuggler. And I know how to further investigations. And so I want to share that with people that, you know, even if you're on patrol, if you come across an empty compartment or you come across a vehicle that's being used to smuggle, don't just let it die with you. You know, you should follow up with it at least at a bare minimum, reach out to somebody and, and collaborate with somebody so that you can, uh, you know, ensure that the, the person gets their justice. You know, it's interesting that you said you'll see a car that you like, but then it's got to meet additional criteria. This is actually one of the significant nuggets that we try to pass along to people. And most cops, I'm sure you were the same way and I was as well, will start out hitting low level things, uh, suspended drivers, small warrants, um, small amounts of narcotics, usually user quantities, paraphernalia. That's a great place to start because, you know, you're getting really accustomed to dealing with low level criminals uh, who have the same characteristics of high-level criminals, essentially, in some sense, we talk about human behavior, but, uh, you know, you're getting better with consent and you're getting better with the rules and calling for a canine and and a lot of that stuff and PC and the paperwork. But what people don't realize is they get stuck there often because 
they get that dopamine hit or they're doing better than everybody else in their agency. Like, oh, well, I'm the guy here. I hit three bags of heroin last night and everybody else got nothing. The reality is if you would like to be profound and have success in this type of work, you should strive and constantly be looking for the next bigger thing. And a very simple fix is to begin to prioritize how you're going to spend your time. You say, well, Dennis, I'm doing criminal patrol. I'm I'm out there doing interdiction. I'm finding drugs and guns and well, great, right? But like, you got to start to develop of a mindset in the sense of, do I or am I hitting these more significant seizures and are they out here and why am I missing them? And And typically the diagnosis is, it is the cars that you are stopping. Would you agree with that? I mean, I ask every guy and girl who's on an interdiction team and who's very successful at this is, when did it really become a different game for you? I'll ask you that question so you get the same answer. Yeah, it's 100% the cars that you're stopping and the people that you're looking at. Uh, when I was on my proactive team before this one, it was uniform team, street level stuff. We're going out and we're looking for you know, street drug dealers. We're looking for gangsters people that are involved in criminal activity, anybody and everybody really. And once I came to my team, my primary focus initially was working informants and working cases. And I did some interdiction. We would do interdiction usually once a week, but the rest of the week I was spent doing investigations. And so what I learned from those investigations was who's involved. You know, it was a it was a shock to me when I first came to the team. I started seeing, you know, high level smugglers and what they drive and uh, what type of people they are. You know, we're stopping like an 82 year old man. We hit we we had this investigation. It's an older one, so I'm sure I can talk about it a little bit. We had an 82 year old man that was driving a pickup. And we must have hit like 500 kilos of coke from him. And what it was is, you know, he would deliver and we would execute search warrants at houses. And ultimately, we ended up arresting him later on. Uh, but, you know, that type of thing is what really opens your eyes to who is out there and, and, and what they're doing. And it slowly taught me what to look for on the roadway. You know, my initial focus was not interdiction. I learned to like interdiction because I just really like being proactive and being out on the highway. And it's, it's just addicting to go out and find the right cars to stop on your own without, you know, any type of, uh, information or any type of data mining or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the cars there's, you know, nice Mercedes SUVs that are driving down the road with $300,000 of cash in them that, most, you know, 99% of cops are just, they're not even looking at them. It's like an old lady driving down the road and, and she's got a compartment in her car that has a ton of cash in it. And, you know, they would never get looked at a second, a second time. And I can't tell you how many times during investigations, we've been following low cars and we've driven right by, you know, other police officers, patrol officers. We've, uh, driven by the highway patrol guys. We've driven through border patrol checkpoints. We've done all sorts of these things. I, I sat there and watched a guy and a girl offload like nine kilos of fentanyl from a floor compartment. And they were about 150 yards away from this uniform police officer that was sitting at a, at a taco stand buying some lunch. And they weren't in a garage. They weren't in, they were just sitting in the parking lot uh, the female was sitting there watching the the cop while he's ordering his tacos, and the guy was unloading the compartment. It was, it's nuts. It's like this stuff is like right under your nose, and unless you are constantly watching for it and picking out the right people, you're gonna miss it. Why did they pick an 82 year old man to move 500 kilograms of cocaine, which is essentially a thousand pounds of coke, on multiple occasions? What was the strategy behind that? I don't know. I mean, I, I would imagine just because he, nobody's going to pull him over. You know, you see him driving down the road and you're just going to not suspect him at all. Um, 
it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. They hire all sorts of different people. We've, you know, we run into juveniles all the time. We run into everyday people that have some people that have decent jobs. Even I, I don't, I don't understand. They just, some people are like really addicted to the adrenaline maybe because they make money at their normal jobs, but they still want to go out and do this. Uh, the bulk of people they're being taken advantage of because, you know, they're broke and who's going to turn down a few thousand dollars to drive a car from point A to point B. It, you know, it's real easy for them to find drivers uh, that it, that are just hurting for money. From my understanding, especially talking to a lot of our informants, it's like they just go to a bar and TJ somewhere and shoulder tap people and say, hey, are you interested in making a couple thousand dollars? And then next thing you know, that person's driving a load of Coke through the border. That TJ Tijuana? Yeah. Yeah, Tijuana. Okay, that was my guess. It's funny because I think about this 82-year-old man that you're talking about. I imagine he he got some kind of conviction at 82. And I would think anything you get as far as jail time is pretty much a life sentence, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And we run into that a lot where it's an older person and the older people, they're the ones that are going to for sure cooperate because they know what's going to happen. You know, if you're 80 years old and you spend 10 years in jail, more than likely you're not coming out of jail. And so they're going to be the first ones that are pointing the fingers at everybody. And, and obviously, you know, informants are, are such a huge part of law enforcement and they're very important to good long-term investigations. You know, they point out all the things that we would never know if we didn't have them helping us out. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's great to run into those type of people because they're going to really put you on some good stuff. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast. And it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally. And we also entertain you as well. I am familiar with a lot of law enforcement officers in this country, and I've been privy to being made aware of some of the violence that goes on in Mexico when we're doing jobs like this. And some of the things that I've seen and heard of when they were working cases or doing undercovers and what happened to the people in Mexico who sometimes brokered deals or, and they went South because it was a, it was a sting. Um, have you bear witness yourself personally, some of the violence that's correlated back to this kind of uh, organization or organizational structure of criminality? I mean, I didn't personally witness it, but yeah, I mean, I, I know of many examples of people that are involved in this game that uh, go to Mexico and they don't come back, let's say. So we call it getting invited to the barbecue, you know, and, and these criminals are ruthless or these organizations are ruthless. So uh, an example of that would be, let's say you interdict a vehicle and that person is working for a cartel and they're smuggling say 20 kilos of Coke, which is very valuable. Uh, when that person gets arrested, what happens is the cartel demands the report. And that's does a couple things. One, it shows that the person didn't steal the dope. Because if the cartel thinks that they stole the dope, that person is going to get kidnapped and killed most likely. Uh, but what it does show is, hey, I didn't steal the dope. I got arrested. I'm sorry. Like, you know, so most of the time they're going to be let off the hook basically because they provided the, the police report. But what does happen is if that person did something that brought the attention on themselves, like let's say they were driving, you know, a hundred miles an hour down the road. And because of that, they got traffic stopped. The cartel is then going to look at them and say, you know what? You fucked up. You were driving a hundred miles an hour with our Coke you owe. So then that person is going to owe uh, you know, some type of money or going to owe work or, or whatever it may be, whatever they deem. So those types of things happen all the time. From my understanding, um, we've had cases where people get arrested and I don't know if they just vanish in Mexico or, you know, if it's cartels that make them disappear. Um, you know, we've had informants that go down to Mexico and they don't come back. Not me personally, but I've heard of it happening, you know, even fairly recently, there was a couple that got killed down there, whether or not that's because of the work that they're doing as an informant or whether it's because they're just dirty in general. I don't know. 
Um, uh, you know, a lot of these informants, they're dirty on the side as well. So they're probably out there brokering deals and, and getting themselves in trouble, even without help in law enforcement. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Before you got into this type of work and becoming essentially a quote unquote expert in the anatomy of a vehicle and deep, deep hides and all this other shit. Did you know a lot about motor vehicles? Because, you know, when I talk to you, dude, you really seem to be a wealth of knowledge when it comes to a lot of parts of the vehicle. So how, did you learn about cars in the field or did you know about cars before this? I learned about it in the field. I mean, I know a little bit about cars, but I'm not a car nerd at all. I don't know a lot about cars in, in intricate details. And so searching cars was very intimidating to me. And especially once I came to my team, you have this idea of, you know, hidden compartments. Oh my God, they're, it's like crazy hard to find them. They're going to be very hidden as the, the name suggests. And so what happened is I would do traffic stops uh, and I would seek out mentors. There's a few different people that I've, I've seeked out as mentors. Um, all of them are from Border Patrol. They're very good at searching vehicles because they've done it their whole career. Um, and you know, that's kind of like half the mission of border patrol is searching cars at their checkpoints and stuff. And so what would happen is I would stop a car and then the border patrol at the time, I didn't have a canine. So a border patrol dog would come, they would do a sniff and then they would help me search. And I would watch these guys who are very good at searching cars. And I was just blown away. And so that's where my true addiction got started is I was just seeing them the way that they would search a car. I'm like, man, I am missing so much stuff. And I, it like started making me feel very, very unconfident in my skills in searching a car. And so from that point, it was just straight dedication into, you know, I want to be as good as I can be with searching a car. And I basically want to be the person that you can call that is going to find it. You know, if you're, if you have a car where you, uh, need a compartment found, I want to be the resource regionally that somebody can call and know that I'm not going to miss it. Or at least if I do miss it, it's something very, very extreme. Um, and so that got it started. And so just from there, it was, you know, every day I was trying to teach myself how to search cars, uh, going to junkyards and searching cars, going to our seizure lots and searching cars, looking at every compartment that I could and, and networking with people was huge is there's a whole bunch of people in this area that do interdiction or, or run into hidden compartments, especially the guys at the border. And we all network with each other. And so if, if I see a type of compartment, I'm going to send it to a whole bunch of people. If they see a certain type of compartment, they're going to send it to me. And it just helps you learn about vehicles because searching a car is very intimidating. If you don't know what the floor of a car would look like, if you lift up the carpet and you look underneath, if you don't know what that should look like, then it's going to be intimidating to you. And you have to know what that type of stuff looks like. You have to know how a car is manufactured so that you can recognize what is not normal. When you went out and were searching cars in junkyards in your tow yard, this is an interesting question that the first thing I thought of was, did you ever find anything that nobody else found when you were searching shit? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you ever I, see the, I, you ever I, see that limo from like uh, I don't know whose crew it was, where the, where the limo was sold off and they actually found the compartment where all the like walls of the limo came down. There were just Mac tens and AK forty sevens in that oh, thing. You ever wow. see that video? You no. ever see that picture? I forgot. It was like I don't want to say what rap crew it was, but it was like a rap crew. They had this whole they had a limo, but it was a trapped out limo with guns inside. We actually had a. Uh, we had a job in our tow yard. They, I think they were cleaning cars and I forgot how this went, but they were getting cars prepped for an auction yeah. and going through them and shit. And I believe our tow yard guy found like $280,000 in cash. Yeah. I mean, that stuff happens. And, and I mean, we've missed stuff like it, it it's kind of funny. Like a lot of times dope gets smuggled in these compartments in even numbers. So like one time we searched a car, we found 19 kilos of Coke and we take it back to the station and we're processing everything. And we're sitting around like, man, 19 is a really odd number. I feel like we probably missed one. And we went back and sure enough, there was one that had like fallen in this crevice. It was, it was in the quarter panels of this vehicle and it had fallen in this crevice. 
and we just didn't see it at the time. So we would have left a kilo of cocaine in there if we didn't go back and find it. But, you know, luckily we did, or, or there's been times where you are talking to a, somebody that you just arrested and, and they start giving up information. And part of it is, yeah, there was dope in an area that you didn't find it. So then we'll go back and we'll, you know, and we'll find it there. But in terms of just going out and searching at a junkyard, I haven't ran into that yet, but I'm sure it exists. I mean, if you're missing stuff and you guys are some of the best of the best, in your personal opinion, and it could be a lay opinion if you want to call it that, because of humility, we don't call ourselves experts at times, but I'd say we're cut above the rest, uh, a lot of us here. And, and with humility, we're also saying, yeah, we know that, we're aware of that, we're in tune with that, and so we're sharing all this stuff with everybody. So we don't just take it to the grave with us. It's such good information for all of you to know. But being that you guys are missing things, how often do you think most cops are missing things? If they're stopping a low car, most cops are always missing it, unless it's a duffel bag in the trunk. You know, if it's any type of compartment, they're missing. I can't, I've stopped so many cars that have had, you know, speeding tickets or whatever, some type of, some type of citation from some cop recently uh, in the car. And I'm talking to the person afterwards and I'm like, Hey, when you got that ticket, were you loaded? And they're like, yeah, that's happened many, many, many times, probably over 20 times. Like it, it, it's crazy how often somebody gets stopped for speeding, they get a ticket and released. And there was probably all sorts of criminal activity written all over this person's face, but that cop was, you know, so uh, addicted to writing tickets that they don't even see it, you know, and, and who knows, maybe it's just somebody that's newer that hasn't had training yet. So I, I, you know, I don't want to throw them down, but you know, that's the whole point in training. You need to seek out training. You need to learn to recognize the, the things that are suspicious, you know, and, and, and that's part of, I, I really hope that as people decide that they want to sign up for my class, I really hope that they're deciding they want to sign up for proactive law enforcement classes, your class, Kenny's class, Brad's class, all these other classes that teach you the right cars to look at, because obviously you're not going to find a compartment if you're not stopping the right car. So you have to stop the right car. You have to learn how to stop the right car. You have to learn what to look for. And then you have to learn how to talk to people. It's, it's so important. The interview, I always say the interview is like my bread and butter. It's, I'm going to stop a car because I like it for whatever reason. Uh, maybe there's a behavior change and then maybe I like some stuff on the registration, uh, some type of like trade craft as, as Sean would call it. Um, once I get the car stopped, I don't know if I'm going to search the car yet. I'm going to decide during my interview. So the way I do it is I'll do my front seat interview. I'll be talking to the person and asking certain questions while I'm running record checks on them. And at the end of my interview with them, that's when I'm deciding, am I going to search this car or not? And if you don't know the right questions to ask and you don't know how to recognize deceptive behaviors, you're going to end up searching a lot of cars that you shouldn't. And that's one of my primary rules is you should believe that you're going to find something in a vehicle before you search it or at least have a real strong suspicion that, hey, I think I'm gonna find something. I highly recommend that people stay away from stopping a car and then doing the old like, oh, well, I got them stopped. I might as well ask for consent. You know, Nobody ever finds 20 kilos of dope doing that. You're not gonna get that lucky where you're like, eh, screw it, I'll just search them anyways. Like, like you're gonna see the criminal behavior you're going to see the deceptive behavior. You're going to see the cover stories that they're giving you and the weird type of travel itineraries that they're going to have. And that stuff is going to all come together. And then you're going to know, okay, this is the car that I want to search. I often tell people in class that I find it actually terrifying that police officers think their priority is to write tickets and actually forego a lot of training to help them understand and recognize criminal activity before, during, and after a criminal offense. You know, essentially, our goal as police officers or our primary function should be law enforcement. And people get that confused with ticket writing. To me, they're not the same thing. That's just me. That is a personal opinion. Uh, but one that's supported by pretty strong facts. And I believe that I could really win a debate uh, against just about anybody in their regards to their one defense of sprayed kills and me is crime kills. Now, people need to recognize is if you don't want to or don't have the skill or desire 
to go out and stop actual crime, which to be honest with you, I can teach you a technique and a method that's so impactful, so simple and so effective that it would actually change the trajectory of your career. And you could be one of the dumbest cops and employ this technique. Very, very simple principles to follow. And you would have significant results and probably a pretty significant reputation. But what people fail to recognize, and you could let me know if you agree with this, is the same red flags that are going up before, during, or after the commission of criminal offense are the same red flags that go up when somebody is looking to cause harm to your life. People don't realize that. So you, we, we watch these videos and we're like, man, even as interdiction guys who have never been involved in any kind of OIS or where somebody tries to take a shot at them, we know right away what's going on and something's not right. And the guard goes up even more just based on the body language. We, I mean, I'm watching, there's a video came out recently. I don't know where it was. Uh, I'm not criticizing the cop, but I go in the guy's, his body language is everything. So it's Sean Pardesi's, I'm, well, Pardesi's is important too. He does a really nice course. Um, but Sean Grogan teaches a body language course and behavior. And there's a significant reason why. There's a video that came out recently where a gentleman's standing in some kind of vestibule. The cop walks up and the guy is acting fucking strange. And you see this all the time with somebody who's getting ready to shoot a cop it is odd, strange behavior. And these cops are not even recognizing these indicators and these clues of like, I'm about to get fucking killed. And I don't know what the result was, but he was shot. There was a female partner there. I think it was in California uh, or Arizona. And dude, the guy like I'm watching, I'm like about to get shot. This motherfucker's about to get shot. And I'm not trying to sit here like I know it all. Like I'm like, this motherfucker's about to get shot. Why are we not drawing our guns right now and getting ready for this battle, right? Is it illegal to draw your gun and at least have it out ready for a possible gunfight? No. Um, I don't care what your agency thinks. I'm not dying in the line of duty because I'm worried about what are they going to say because I unholstered my weapon in a situation that's very rare and unique, and I knew something was very wrong. So would you agree that those red flags will be the same ones when somebody's looking to cause harm to you? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I mean, if you look at the people that are involved in these types of incidences and, you know, most of the time, if you watch the video and, and I get it, we're Monday morning quarterbacking, we're not there. So it, who are we to, to, you know, question what anybody did or didn't see. But a lot of times when watching the video, you can see these things ramping up. You can see different types of behaviors where like, oh, something's about to happen. And I think proactive or people that are proactive are more in tune to recognizing that type of behavior. And they're going to be the ones that are jumping on it right away that are not letting things like that happen. And I mean, it goes to show like I, like I, when I was on patrol, I was very proactive in terms of like restraining people or putting people in a position of disadvantage or just maintaining the type of posture to where somebody doesn't want to fight me. And so because of that, like I was in very few uses of forces I mean, there was some where obviously, you know, some people are going to fight, they're going to fight or they're going to run, they're going to run. But the whole point is like, if you are a good, uh, confident police officer, you know what you can and can't do, you're going to control the situation from the get go and you're not going to run into these problems. And part of the problem is somebody that is just going out and writing tickets and not caring about those types of things. They're the ones that end up in these videos where bad things happen. And, you know, most of the time you can tell it's somebody that pulled somebody over for some type of traffic violation and things spiral out of control because they're there to write a ticket and they're not there to control the situation. When I talk to you, I know outside of this podcast, you and I've had quite a few conversations. I consider you a friend. You're part of the family now. And, and the last question I have for you, and we'll do this again for sure. And I've kind of prefaced this before just a hair I heard a lot of stories of people missing stuff and and people who are expected to not miss things, missing things. And you're stepping in essentially and saying, hey, did you guys look here? So with that being said, what motivated you to design a class like this? What was the deficiency that you saw in the profession of law enforcement in our space that you said, "I, I we got to fix this shit and I think I know how? When you teach a subject, you can really only teach from your personal experience. Uh, the old school way of law enforcement training is they have a program that's designed. It may not even be that instructor's material. And they're basically just teaching this program. And whether or not they're even an expert in that material is even questionable. 
what I wanted to do is share my experience. I live in an area that we, you know, I'm on a very proactive team. We run into a lot of different stuff. I'm very fortunate to see the things that I see uh, at a rapid pace. You know, we see them constantly, uh, multiple times a week usually. And so what my goal is, is I want to show how to identify all these different compartments through our methods. And so we're obviously being successful. We're, we're finding most of the compartments, you know, we're not perfect. We're going to miss stuff too, uh, occasionally, but usually we'll learn from that. If, if we miss something or if I miss something, I'm not going to sleep for a couple of weeks and I'm going to dwell on it. And hopefully later on, we end up interdicting them. I have one that, uh, well, I've had two that really stand out that, you know, I searched the car for multiple hours, knew it was there, knew I was missing it, but I just couldn't find it. And later on through talking to different people and, and, uh, doing some research on the vehicle, we ended up identifying what I missed. And then we went after him and we got him later on. So those types of stories I can share. Uh, the other thing is a lot of people have this, what I consider a misconception of that compartments are regional and they are regional in the term or in the aspect of there's probably more of a certain type of compartment in a certain region, but that doesn't mean that every compartment doesn't exist. So one thing that I did when I was designing this class is I did some research on Epic or rather I had a partner do it, but somebody did some research on Epic and looked up seizures for certain types of compartments. Take gas tanks, for example. Um, gas tanks is widely considered a border type compartment or border type concealment. So when we ran that, we saw that there was something like 2,500 gas tank loads that were seized in the United States in the last few years. And it put a, we, we dropped pins on a map and it showed that they were across the United States. So if you think that gas tank loads aren't being used in your area, you're wrong. It, it, you know, Kenny talks about it in his class. Kenny had a gas tank load up in his area. I'm just telling you that it is so easy to exploit a gas tank that criminals would be dumb to not do it. Same thing with intake manifold. Intake manifold is something that you would consider border related or cross country related. It doesn't take that long to take apart certain intake manifolds and put dope inside of them. Maybe 30 minutes. They could open it up, pull the dope out, put money in, close it back up and the car could be on its way. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's not a quick access electronic compartment where they're going to pull kilos out and do a parking lot deal, but that's the type of car that you're going to encounter. And we've had investigations of all these different types of compartments that have gone throughout the United States. So I would like to basically bring my material to everybody throughout the United States and say, Hey, look, you should be looking for everything. When you search a car, if you stop the right car, you interview the occupants and you believe you're going to find something and you start searching the car, you should be looking for everything and at least knowing what to look for. So, you know, are you going to hit an intake manifold? Maybe, maybe not, but are you going to know what to look for and identify it? Yeah. You, Cause you've seen it before through training. And when you come across it, you're going to say, you know what, that's not right. Uh, if you don't have the confidence in clearing it, you might be able to call somebody from there and, and figure it out. I've done the same thing. There, there was a, a certain type of intake manifold that I had no experience with, but I saw it, you know, I could see all the tooling and tampering. I'm like, I know it's in there, uh, or I'm pretty sure it's in there, but I don't know how to clear this one. So I made a call on the roadside and got some help and, and it worked out, you know, I ended up being able to, to seize it. So I want to expose people to what we're doing out here. I want to expose them to all these different types of compartments and, you'll be surprised. A lot of these compartments that we're running into are the same ones that you're running into on the East coast or, or very similar, at least. Um, I think that there's a lot more electronics on the East coast versus out here. They're still exploiting the same voids. They're just not as many electronics. They, they still exist, but you know, while we have say like a center console trap, they might just exploit the center console by popping off something versus having a actuator that opens it up that, that would be more East coast style. And I think what that boils down to is a lot of these cars are going through x-rays and those electronic components, you can see them in the x-rays. So what they're trying to do is avoid that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I want to expose people to, to what we do. I want to show them that these compartments are not just at the border. They're everywhere. And if you're not looking for them, if you're not finding them, then very likely you're missing them. Maybe somebody hears a class like this and says, oh, I'm just a patrol officer. Oh, I'll just do my thing out here. You know, I, I this is this is for more high level. You have to be on an interdiction team. I don't work a highway. What do you say to that? Is our last thing here? What do you say to somebody who's saying, "Well, this isn't for me. I am proactive, but this isn't for me. I don't. I don't think that stuff's here." What's your What's your response to that? I think it's for everybody. I I think back of what I know now, and how many cars I have stopped in the past where I was like, you know what? And and I'm talking street level stuff there's something here. And I search a car and I can't find it. How easy is it for somebody to, let's say, lift up the carpet on their floorboard and slide a bag of dope under their seat and then just put the kick plate back down and, and nobody would ever find that. If you don't lift up the carpet and look under underneath, you would never find that. It does, it's not going to stand out. It's only say an ounce of, of meth. It, you, you have to be able to search the car in depth and you know maybe you're working in a city where you're not going to hit a bunch of compartments but you're still going to find stuff people still hide stuff in the cars to where you can't find them you know they pop the door panels off and they put stuff in the doors they pop the center console panels and they put them inside the center console they do all sorts of different stuff uh where they hide things i i had a patrol guy that was on a stop and there was like some type of information that this person had just purchased two guns and they left a the house and they called me and they're like, dude, we know that they just picked up two guns. We can't find it. And so I was like, well, you know, start popping the panels. I told them a couple different spots, but one of the spots was pop the panels in the center console and look in there because that's a very common spot for people like gangsters to hide stuff. And sure enough, they popped the center console panels off and there was two pistols in there. So it's, you know, if you're out and you're running around as a, as a regular patrol guy with a year on patrol and you're trying to be proactive, you need to know how to search a car so that you don't miss little things like that. Like, is it going to be in their pockets most of the time? Yeah. Is it going to be just sitting in a bag? It, it may be, but you need to know how to search the whole car and to clear the whole car or else you're going to end up missing the better stuff. I think of this one story I had, and I'm going to try to keep it as vague as possible. And we'll finish with this. I had a Somebody I knew reached out to me on a narcotics division and said, hey, hey, dude, I hate to bother you. I haven't heard from this guy in four or five years. But uh, we, we we know we got dope in this car and looked everywhere. Uh, you got you got like one of those guys. And like, dude, this is somebody I like, right? They're like personally, they're a friend of mine. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let me reach out to three guys right away. And it had to be like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, hope somebody answers because everybody's on administrative schedules, <laughs> right? And fortunately enough, uh, Brad answered Gilmore. So I said, hey, do me a favor, just reach out to this guy. He is a friend of mine. Um, and Brad calls me back 15 seconds later. And he goes, yeah, they found it. I go, where was it? He goes, dude, it was in the fucking, um, the the dome light of the car, the interior light on the on the ceiling. He's like, yeah. I just told him to pop that panel. It's all sitting right there. It was all yeah, on this side of the, the, the United States. Heroin's packaged in like these little, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but these little, they look like, uh, like fried wonton bags they fold them up and they're called decks of heroin bags of heroin uh bundles and bricks so there's bricks which is essentially uh a bundle uh, is 10 10 bags of brick is five of those 10 bags so it's a a, hey had multiple bricks just laying in the you know in in the roof interior compartment of the vehicle but you know it was comical because i'm like here's somebody assigned to a narcotics division who couldn't find one of the most simple places or didn't even dawn on this person. Like, what are we doing with our time? How are we training as a narcotics detective? Dude, that, uh, you know, you that could... brings up a really good point also is I can't tell you how many times we've executed a search warrant in a house and the dope was in a hidden compartment in a vehicle in the garage. So if you don't know how to, let's say you're a narcotics detective and you get information. Yeah. There's uh, 20 kilos going to this house. You watch the car pull into the garage. You watch the car leave. You're like, okay, the house is loaded. We know it is. You execute a search warrant. You go search the house and you're not finding it. If you don't know how to search the car that's in the garage, you're going to miss it. You know, it's happened to us. We we missed a compartment inside of a house one time. And, you know, it, it it's unfortunate that it happened, but luckily we went back and 
we listened to their jail calls and the guy was like, Hey, go to this spot in the house and move those mirrors or some, whatever he said. And we're like, uh, we need to get out there right now. And so we went out there and ended up finding it. So it all worked out in the end, but, um, you know, many, many times we've hit houses and there's trapped out cars in the garage. And those are the cars that have the dope sitting inside of them. I got plenty of pictures and videos that I have in my class. So even from an investigator standpoint, yeah, you're not going to be searching a car every day, but you're fooling yourself if you think that you're not going to have to search a car at some point and you need to know how to find it, especially if you want to do any type of high level narcotics investigations. That's just lack of training is what it boils down to. They just need more training. And, and it's amazing. Yeah. Everything we talk about always comes back to more training. Dennis, why did you start a training company? Yeah. <laughs> Literally everything ties back to training, right? So yeah. we know it's got to get fixed. How else would you fix it? You know, leadership training, interdiction training, case law training, medical tactical training, interviewing from the best that I can find thus far, right. you know? And I mean the best in the sense of not only your practical skills and application of the process, but also as a human being, you've got to match what we believe is our culture. And that's something we're very proud of here at this organization. It's that like, we're not dicks, right? Like, <laughs> you know how it's, you laugh at that because I know that you understand what I mean when I say that. Yeah, You know, we're not dicks. And sometimes you think you're going to somewhere and you're going to go to, an, uh, you know, a, a classroom setting and the guy or girl's teaching the class is a fucking dick. Yeah. I won't tolerate it. I've got rid of some dicks. And, and that's why you're uh, entering into our team is, is, you know, welcome with open arms. You're a good fucking dude, bro. We've spent time together. And I, and I know that you appreciate not being a dick because I'm sure people in your past have been a dick to you. Yeah. I mean, and you know, I know I'm not the best at what I do. There's obviously oh, the humility, but you guys everybody. are so fucking funny. Yeah, like, dude. It's so funny. Cause you guys are all the fucking same. Like Kenny's always like, how did you get lucky a lot? Like 10, you're the fucking <laughs> top 10 interdiction guys in the country. Right. Jeremy top 10 interdiction teams in the country. I'm sure of it. There's no question about it. Right. And, yeah, I mean, and, and maybe, are, I'll, I'll give my team props. Like there's, we have 15 guys and they are very good. And there's a lot of very senior guys on my team. You know, a few of them are only a couple of years away from retiring and they're still getting after it every day. You know, we see big loads all the time. They're working informants. They're, you know, driving multiple hours doing surveillance, you know, all the way, all the way from the border to, to Los Angeles all the time. And, you know, most guys, when they're, when they're their age, they're not doing that. So these guys are all very capable. So it's, it's great. I learned from people that I consider the the best around. So I, I don't think I'm the best. I, I definitely have some stuff to learn, but I have a good knowledge base and I want to share it. And, and I'm looking forward to it. This has been great. And folks for his class, check out treecop.com. More to come. If you don't see it, refresh back on the website. Every couple of days we are booking. Jenna's putting 14, up, I'm sorry, 14, 40 classes up today. But uh, anyway, man, I appreciate you so much. And thank you for taking the time today to share your knowledge with these men and women, but check back on our website all the time. And Jeremy will be coming to your area. He'll be coming around the United States. And again, don't forget a lot of our instructors like Jeremy, they're full-time cops still. So if they get within a distance that's feasible for you to get to, don't fucking, they're not gonna be 20 minutes from your house, right? Get in your fucking car and, or get somewhere and, and drive the couple hours to go take these training courses. They're there. They are worth their weight in gold. It'll change your career. So Appreciate you, man. Thanks for being here. And anybody can feel free to hit me up too. They can find me on Instagram or, or Facebook if they want to network or or just have any questions. So looking forward to Give out to your it. Instagram handle. Uh just Jeremy Bettingfield underscore SCT. There you go. It's right. right there. <laughs> All right, dude. I'll talk to you. Appreciate you. Right. Take it easy. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.